Hello and a very warm welcome to this evening's internal medicine webinar on how to manage complicated endocrine conundrums with Professor Rob Fowle. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, for, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ellie and I'm one of the commercial managers here at VBS. And for anyone perhaps meeting VBS for the first time this evening, welcome and we really hope you enjoy tonight's webinar. Here at VBS, we have a team of friendly and supportive veterinary specialists whose aim is to increase collaborative ways of working between vets in practice and specialists, improving your patient's access to specialist veterinary care. We empower first opinion vets to work in real time together alongside our specialists to deliver specialist level care to their own patients in their own clinics. Our goal is for you to see our specialists as an extension of your own team. We are on hand to support you, your patients and their owners with affordable and timely help, offering specialist support in 11 disciplines, including, of course, our fantastic internal medicine service, alongside our leading live guided cardiac workup and abdominal ultrasound services. We're also launching our brand new internal medicine mentorship program with Professor Rob Fowle, further expanding the virtual support available to you. VVS's internal medicine mentorship provides tailored support and personal guidance to help you achieve your own medicine related career aspirations, working together to help you become the clinician you want to be. The mentorship program builds on a problem oriented approach to medicine cases, which you will definitely get a glimpse into tonight as Rob discusses some of these challenging endocrine cases. If you're interested in mentorship with Rob, please do get in touch via our website for more information. You can scan the QR codes on your screen to take you there. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce Rob to you tonight. Rob is an RCVS and European specialist in small animal internal medicine. Rob qualified from the RVC in 1996. After four years spent in genuinely mixed practice, he pursued his passion for small animal internal medicine and undertook his residency training at the University of Cambridge, before then going on to become a recognised specialist in 2005. Rob joined Dick White Referrals in 2003, where he set up and ran the internal medicine and medical oncology services until 2016. He became a partner and clinical director of Dick White Referrals for five years before leaving in December last year. He has also been involved in teaching students at the University of Nottingham since 2008 and has been a professor of small animal medicine at Nottingham since 2020. We are so lucky to have Rob on the VVS team and here presenting on this topic tonight. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to pop those in the chat box and we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. And we may also try and answer some as we go along. <laughs> and without any further ado, I will pass over to Rob. Ellie, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, I'm not sure I like this introduction more. I feel very old when everyone, you know, there's probably people who are still at primary school when I qualified, so I'm now very <laughs> nervous. Thank you very much, and thank you for the very warm welcome um, to be part of VVS and to be here this evening. Um, and friends and colleagues, thank you very much indeed for joining me. I hope you're somewhere cool. Um, uh, you probably had a, a fairly busy day, um, so I hope you managed to relax and find this evening's um, webinar uh, in, uh, informative, uh, helpful and, and probably most of all, from my point of view, enjoyable. Um, if you're watching or listening to this on a recording, thank you very much indeed also for giving up uh, even more of your personal time to, to listen. And I, I hope, again, you find this to be the same. Um, now, I, I've got a real passion for endocrinology. I, I think they're really fascinating cases because it's normal physiology gone a little bit wrong. And if you understand the normal physiology, then you can understand why, well, what goes wrong or why it goes wrong. But sometimes they can be complicated cases um, because uh, particularly if you're in the middle of a very busy clinic, um, what you don't necessarily have is the time to go to make quick decisions um, is to work out how, uh, what to do um, because of what is going wrong. So what I'd like to do this evening is I've got five cases prepared. Um, I think uh, Ellie and I think we'll probably have time to get through four, um, but then that's a little tease of something we can do in the, uh, in, in the mentorship sessions. Um, but what I'd like to do this evening is take you through these cases. They're genuine cases that I've seen at some point during my, my career. Um, the first case, which was quite a long time ago, but it's still relevant. Um, and I'd like to introduce you through this to the concept of problem oriented medicine as well, um, which I hope is going to give you a framework um, as a what to do when you don't know what to do 
in very busy clinical practice. And I hope by if by taking this approach we're going to take tonight, um, you will gain confidence to uh, be able to see your way through um, your own, uh, not just endocrine cases actually, but particularly any potentially complicated medicine case. I also hope that we can show you that how we at VVS can help work with you in patients like this by just helping create a structure, run through results, give you um, directions and to work alongside you in the management of your patients. Um, so that's that's my aim for this evening. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to um, uh, Bentley's a little dog, or quite a big dog actually, he was a nine-year-old Irish setter. He's one of the first patients I ever saw when I was working with Dick White. Um, and he, he just sticks out in my memory, partly because the clinical story I'm going to take you through just now, but also because I was just fresh out of my residency and uh, I was... Dick obviously was at that point probably the most famous veterinary surgeon in, in the country, if not in, in Europe, and certainly most respected. Um, and I was his young little medic, um, and uh, I think I felt the pressure. And as you'll see as we're going through it, um, I was under a little bit of pressure with him when he didn't quite do what we were expecting. Um, but it was a good lesson in why applying problem oriented medicine approach works. So um, I don't have a photo of him, um, uh, which I really apologize for because he was a lovely dog with lovely owners. Um, and unlike the normal case of nice dog and nice owners, we did eventually get him right. So there we are. So Benley actually came to see me on a Thursday evening. Um, not a Friday, um, make a change. And the history was, was genuine that the vets, um, he'd presented to the referring vet because he was um, probably been normal seven to 10 days previously, but over the last week, he had started to particularly drink much more and urinate much more um, to the point that on the uh, Wednesday night to Thursday morning, he'd actually had a urinary accident in the house overnight. And I think we all know that there's not many things that would get known to present at your front door quicker than having a urinary accident in the house that they weren't expecting. Um, and the vet wanted some bloods and his blood machine had broken. So he <laughs> referred him over to us, but then he realized he couldn't get the results he wanted. So um, I had a, a, a good chat with his owners and, and it was quite clear that he truly had been normal about a week to week and a half before. And there'd been this quite sudden increase in his drinking um, and urination. Um, he wanted to go out more often and he was uh, passing more urine in terms of volume. He was standing and urinating for a longer period. The owners always thought that he'd become a bit more dull and lethargic. Um, he wasn't quite himself. He certainly wasn't a normal, uh, lovely loony tune that our setters can be in the consult. Um, and in the 48 hours before I came, he came to see me, he'd gone off his food, which was very, very unlike him. He was a, a dog who um, ate really well. He was in good condition, wasn't fat, but he... So those are his, um, his, main, his main presenting uh, complaints from the owner's point of view. So I did, a, a, as we would, a, a detailed examination. And uh, suffice to say, on my initial exam, I could find absolutely nothing wrong at all. Um, his lymph node palpation was normal, his mucous membrane color was normal, um, he had actually reasonable teeth for a dog of his age, his cardiopulmonary auscultation revealed no abnormal rhythm, no abnormal sounds, his pulse was normal, um, his uh, thoracic percussion was unremarkable, I thought his chest compressibility was unremarkable, and his abdominal pal palpation, um, I was actually able to get a really detailed abdominal palpation, he didn't seem to have any signs of pain, discomfort, no organomegaly, um, and his rectal temperature was normal. Um, so uh, at this point, I was thinking, hmm, this is interesting. So before I go into what I'd like to do for you now is, is, is if we were running a seminar or live session, I would actually ask you to, what would you want to do and why? And, and what I'd like you to do is just spend five seconds now thinking, well, what would I do in that situation? Maybe even write it down. Um, um, because I'm going to challenge maybe some of your thinking, I hope in a constructive manner. Um, because the way we need to approach these cases might sound formulaic, but there's a, there's a way we could do it the right way each time. And I hope I'm going to take you through that. So um, just a little thing, what would you do and why? And I'll, I'll then say what, what I did and without sounding arrogant, why I think what we were going to do was the right way forward. Okay. So what I did was I made a problem list. And, and this is, I think some of you will probably written down, I'll take some bloods or I'll do a urine test or uh, maybe I'll do some imaging. And the problem is that although we're probably going to end up doing all of those things, we don't know what we're looking for and we don't know why we're doing the test. Uh, okay, we've got a problem list, but we don't know what disease states we're looking for and what questions we're trying to answer. 
And one of the fundamental things that I would suggest that if you, I maybe teach you to, to suck eggs, um, but if you're in a situation you're not quite sure what to do, we need to know why we're doing a diagnostic evaluation. What test, what results are we looking for? What answers are we looking to get from the test we're going to do? And the best way to do that is to create a problem list uh, of the major presenting signs or your major abnormalities on physical examination. Obviously, there's no physical abnormalities on Bentley because he <laughs> looked completely normal other than what the owner said. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to construct a differential diagnosis list, which can be very broad at this stage. Or what do you think that maybe, for example, the top three things, diseases could cause each problem? And what you'll find is you start seeing the same diseases occurring again and again. And then we can make a top three what I think might be wrong list. And if you've got a top three what I think might be wrong list, we can then do specific tests to rule in or rule out those conditions. And that then means we actually were doing bloods, for example, if we thought that, as we're coming to Bentley had renal failure, we would say, I'm doing this blood test to see if his urea and creatinine are elevated. That's one example. Because, uh, and it just helps focus our minds what we're going to do. So that's the, the sort of thought process behind how we're going to investigate Bentley. And actually it's thought process behind it, which I'm going to show all of the cases that we will we'll try to get through this evening. So my uh, major problem is, particularly because the owner was concerned about the, the, the urinary incontinence or urinary accident overnight, was he's definitely drinking more. And I call it polydipsy here. And he had urinary incontinence and polyuria. And polyuria he definitely had. Um, he was lethargic. Now, if you look at polydipsy and polyuria, as we're coming to, there's a very clear differential diagnosis list for polydipsy. And it's a really good way of getting into a handle to get into a case. But lethargy, um, heat waves can cause lethargy, as I think most of us sitting here could, could appreciate today. So it's not necessarily a very specific clinical symptom or sign. Um, so at the moment, I, I'm going to put lethargy down on my, I don't know why I'm going to create a differential list for that. And an appetence, again, we could have an appetence could have a very, could be very specific. It could have a you know, gastric cause, intestinal cause, metabolic cause, whatever it might be. But it could it be linked to whatever that, the, the cause of the polydips in the polyuria is. So the major handle and the differential diagnosis that I really want to get into is what could make the patient polyuric and or polydipsic. So there was my problem list. I then created this little differential diagnosis list. And um, I think we'll, we'll come to this. Um, there are lots and lots of different ways of how you can list possible causes of polyuria and polydipsia. And I don't know how you were taught in a vet school or if you, in your subsequent reading. Um, the way I personally approach PUPD cases or, is to look at them and say, it's either an endocrine disease or it's a non-endocrine disease. And I'm not saying that just because this is an endocrine webinar. <laughs> it's because I find this a really helpful um, approach because the list of diseases is actually relatively small. So if you think about what endocrine disease could make you polydipsic or polyuric? Obviously, the one that instantly springs to mind is poly, probably diabetes mellitus. Um, and then quite quickly after that, you think, well, if I've got diabetes, it could be non-sugar diabetes, it could be diabetes insipidus. The second thing you may think of though after diabetes is Cushing's, because, yeah, and he's a nine-year-old dog, so diabetes mellitus or Cushing's are definitely um, both things that he's within the age bracket for those two diseases to occur. If it was a cat, hyperthyroidism would definitely be an endocrine disease that will make cats drink more. Um, and then lastly, actually, the one that often people don't know think about is hyperparathyroidism, where you make too much parathyroid hormone, which causes hypercalcemia, and that actually causes polyuria with a secondary polydipsia. And you could then come up with some other weird and wonderful. So fundamentally, they are the five main endocrine differentials for a patient that's PUPD. Okay. If you think about non-endocrine disease, then you think, okay, the one that probably springs to mind is renal failure. Okay, both, both cats and dogs, patients in, in sort of early uh, iris stage one, two, particular stage two, stage three renal failure will, will obviously be polyuric and potentially polydipsic. Linked to that, though, possibly more common in younger patients, pyelonephritis, true bacterial infection within the kidney, markedly interferes with the way that antidiuretic hormone works. And it, it, actually, pyelonephritis causes a partial nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So, um, although it's not always as easy to diagnose as it may sound, pyelonephritis is something that we probably see more commonly in practice than, than um, particular renal failure. What else, from a non-endocrine point of view, can make you PUPD? Well, hypercalcemia that's non-endocrine in origin. 
and obviously we need to think about um you know if you think of hypercalcemia i think most of you think oh it must have cancer well actually only 50 maybe max 60 percent of patients who are hypercalcemic will have a neoplastic process okay um so hyperparathyroidism will account for the vast bulk of the rest and we'll come on to hypervitamosis d in, in a second but certainly cancers any cancer actually potentially can cause um hypercalcemia the major three though are lymphoma multiple myeloma and anal sac adenocarcinoma. So just a little clinical tip, if you have a patient who is hypercalcemic, it is absolutely mandatory you do a digital rectal examination, have a really good feel of those anal sacs, and make sure you can express them completely. Anal sac adenocarcinomas normally are fairly obvious to palpate, but they can be small. So just make sure we can empty the anal sacs completely. So my top three sort of uh, non-endocrine uh, causes of PUPD could be renal failure, pyelonephritis, and hypercalcemia. Another one could be hyperviscosity. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean a condition where the blood is literally thicker than is normal. What can make the blood thicker than normal? Well, actually, number one cause would be high levels of protein. Uh, and so you can get, I mean, if you think of something like multiple myeloma, a multiple myeloma is a, a, a cancer. It's a, it's a bone marrow normally derived cancer of the plasma cells. The plasma cells are our differentiated B cells that make antibody. So what happens in a multiple myeloma is you get one clone of one of the B cell families that becomes neoplastic and they start pumping out their immunoglobulin um, because that's what they've been programmed to do. And so you get vast quantities of globulins. And you think back to the structure of globulins and immunoglobulins, that little Y-shaped antibody that we see. If you've got too many of those running around your bloodstream, then literally the blood becomes thicker than it should be. And the, the body, for reasons aren't totally understood, then perceives that there was dehydration. Um, so hyperviscosity, the, the brain goes, I must be hydrated. The blood is thicker, excuse my the colloquialism, um, and therefore it makes you polydipsic. But you could also have hyperviscosity from too many cells within the blood. So particularly um, a leukemic patients will often be polydipsic, although that's not always just due to hyperviscosity. The classic hyperviscosity cellular abnormality would be polycythemia, uh, where we have too many red cells, where again, those literally the blood is becoming like treacle and <clears throat> the hypothalamus perceives that as being due to dehydration and therefore makes you polydipsic and attempt to compensate for that. So those would be my the, the major sort of four things. Then we can have renal tubular disease, hepatic disease, pyometra, if it's an entire female dog, obviously. Um, but they're the main ones that we can think of. So if I'm going back to my differential diagnosis list for Bentley, then we've got some diseases here that we can rule in or rule out really very quickly if we do the most appropriate testing and ask the right questions. So notice I'm not saying we're just going to do a serum biochemistry or a chem seven, whatever we want to call it, a panel. I'm going to be doing tests to try to say, well, what do I want in my biochemistry? I need to rule in or rule out that he's got diabetes mellitus. So we definitely need a urine sample. We need to look at some glucose. Uh, so look at the glucose in the urine. But I want, to, I want glucose in my biochemistry panel. Um, uh, and one thing about diabetes, normally diabetic dogs are hungry. So if he is not hungry and he's inappetent, I'm actually worried he's ketotic. So we need to be able to look at ketones in the urine as well. So I've got to make sure I'm using a dipstick that has ketones. Um, if I think you might have Cushing's, then actually, okay, you don't can't diagnose Cushing's on a routine biochemistry, but we can look for markers of it. Very high cholesterol, very high alkaline phosphatase, high protein creatinine ratio on the urine sample. I need to know what his urine creatinine are because of renal failure. And I need to know what his calcium levels are. And actually, I'm going to look at calcium. I need to know his albumin level because 50% of the calcium in the bloodstream is bound to albumin. So if he's got very high albumin, then the calcium might go up. So an ionized calcium would be really lovely if you've got access to it. Um, and I also need to look at his protein levels, the albumin globulin for the cities hyperviscus. And I need to look at the red cell, white cell and platelet count. So I've got a list of things now by doing a problem oriented approach. I want my blood test to tell me or my, my, my diagnostic evaluation to tell me. Um, and that's why looking at the differential diagnosis of PUPD is just so helpful in this endocrine, non-endocrine fashion for me. And if you have a, a different way, that's fine, as long as you can apply the same principles of what do I want to know from my diagnostic evaluation. Look at my other differential, as I said, lethargy could be almost any of these diseases, so we won't look at that specifically. And likewise, the inappetence, it might relate to the cause of the PUPD, but I'm also going to say, have I got more than one problem? Have I, uh, I've just written an article on, on a meprazole and, and, and gastric ulcers. So has, have we got a dog here who's got 
Cushing's, who was on uh, Metacam, for example, has now got a, a severe gastric ulcer. It's possible. So always on the back of your mind, there might be more than one uh, problem, and we can't all shoehorn the explanation into one disease. So that's my differential list. So what are we going to do? So my diagnostic plan I came up with at Bentley was, right, I'm going to look for urinalysis first, because it's quick and easy. He's peeing like crazy, so getting urine samples is not a problem. And I'm going to look, first of all, at the USG is. Is he truly got inappropriate urine concentration, which would support him being polydipsic? Okay. I'm going to look for evidence of infection. I'm going to look for uh, glucose. Left that off the slide, sorry. I'm going to look for evidence of ketones. I'm going to run a serum biochemistry, and I'm going to look specifically for his renal parameters, glucose, alkaline phosphatase, and cholesterol, actually, as well, calcium in the proteins. And I want the complete blood count to look for inflammatory markers and any evidence of a leukemic change. Okay, so um, I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> that was that's where and why I was going to do these things. And I'm explaining this in more detail at this point in the, in the lab webinar, just trying to explain why, how this problem orientated approach I hope you will find to be helpful. All righty, let's get back to Bentley. So Bentley is in the hospital, weeing and everywhere and drinking everything. And so this was the first thing we got. So his urinalysis, <clears throat> I've got a specific gravity of 1010. Um, so which is in the isothenuric range. Um, if you think normal, normal urine is supposed to be concentrated above 1015. I have to ask, I think most of us in the internist world would say that normal dog urine should be at least 1020 and normal cat urine should be at least 1030 in terms of USG. Um, but and anything less than 1008 is definitely um, abnormal. But what uh, 1010 tells me is that I've got <clears throat> tubules that are, um, probably work to some degree, but it's obviously he is, uh, there is more, is more dilute than it should be. But interestingly, I've instantly ruled out, we have instantly ruled out some of our uh, differentials. There's no glucose, no ketones. So by definition, Bentley cannot be diabetic. Um, there's no evidence of abnormal protein. There's no evidence of um, high white cells. And a sediment examination is unremarkable. Uh, although I've if any of you have spoken to me, I, I do worry that there occasionally we can have pyelonephritis without a rip roaringly active sediment. But this pretty much is very suggestive. There's no evidence of a urinary tract infection. And also the lack of protein doesn't rule out Cushing's, but it, normally patients with Cushing's would have a very high urine to protein creatinine ratio. Um, and we don't have a UPCR yet, but negative protein makes it less likely. So, now, really interested to know what we've got on our biochemistry. Now, I've had time to follow just to make it legible um, on the slides. I've done these in two, um, uh, two slides. So <clears throat> this was uh, Bentley's presenting biochemistry. Um, and if you go back, what we first thing we want to know is urea and creatinine. Well, they are boring, actually, really, aren't they? It's creatinine at 54. And I think the urea at 2.1 is slightly low. Um, so no evidence of urinary tract uh, dysfunction, renal uh, disease on these bloods here at all. Um, looking at globulins, fairly happy 26 grams per litre globulin, so that's bang in the middle of normal range, so no evidence of a, a hyperglobulinemia and no levels of abnormal albumin either. What about his liver parameters? Well, ALT is a liver marker, hepatocellular marker. Alkaline phosphatase is not a hepatocellular marker, it comes from the bile caniculi more than anything else. Um, obviously, intimately related to the liver. But ALT at 73 is slightly higher than normal but not really enough to write home about at this stage. Don't know how to interpret that. And likewise, Alkfos 176 is a little bit above normal range. But um, at the moment, I'm not sure how to interpret that because alkaline phosphatase, if you remember in dogs, there is also a, a cortisol-induced isomer of dogs. Um, so and it's why alkaline phosphatase goes very high in patients with Cushing's because they've got very high levels of endogenous cortisol, which eludes the steroid in, um, I, induced isomer of alkaline phosphatase into the bloodstream. So any dog that's not feeling very well and is a bit stressed for whatever reason will often have slightly high, higher than normal levels of alkaline phosphatase. So at the moment, I don't know how to interpret ALT and ALP other than saying, I'm not too worried. I think they're probably unremarkable. Yeah, that's relating to whatever's going on underneath it. His blood glucose is normal, um, so he's definitely not diabetic. His cholesterol is normal, so again, makes Cushing's less likely. So what about the other things? So look at his electrolytes. Well, sodium, ooh, sodium normal, potassium, that's fairly normal. Chloride, top end of normal, probably okay. Well, hey, but we've got very high calcium and slightly subnormal phosphate. 
Okay. So suddenly if we go, that starts getting really interesting because we had on our differential diagnosis list, hypercalcemia as a potential cause of polyuria, polydipsia, and certainly calcium at, at, at this sort of level will, will stop dogs eating. And, and this is totally anecdotal. I've not seen this in any textbooks at all. But in me, for me, a dog that has a total calcium of greater than four mil, millimoles per liter, so that would equate to an ionized calcium of a two to 2.2 2 and above, um, almost always go off the food completely. Um, uh, so uh, I'm not sure I've got an extra, adequate explanation for that, Charles, but that's something I've seen. Certainly hypercalcemia in humans is associated with gastrointestinal pain um, and nausea. Um, Bentley certainly didn't seem to have any signs of that, and I've not noticed that consistently in my patients um, before. But certainly high calcium will put dogs off their food completely. So have we got an answer, or is it the beginnings of an answer? We do still need to look at the, at the CBC. So, and I, with this, he's got uh, maybe a slight neutrophilia. Um, I haven't put the film comment here, but it was just a mature, slight left shift neutrophilia. And if you look at it, his lymphocyte count is slightly low. Now, if a um, uh, patient, if you think about who is slightly unwell, this is could be a mild stress leukogram, where the presence of cortisol or increased amounts of cortisol because of the stress of a disease releases neutrophils from the marginated pool in the bone marrow, but cortisol is lymphocytotoxic. That's why we use prednisolone in lymphoma patients, because it kills uh, lymphocytes. So any patient that's got high neutrophils and low lymphs makes me think it's probably a stress leukogram and just reflects the presence of the disease that's causing them to not feel great. Okay. Um, but that's, that's how I interpreted his stress leukogram. Oh, sorry, his, his, his hematology. So... If we go back to the differential diagnosis list that we had, this is the list that I created a couple of minutes ago, but we can now gray out quite a few of these. He doesn't have diabetes. It's unlikely he's got Cushing's. He doesn't have consistent clinical signs and his blood patch picture doesn't match it. I'm not saying he definitively doesn't have it, but it's very, very unlikely. And the Cushing's does not make patients hypercalcemic. Okay, um, you do get calcinosis cutis, but it's or you can, but it's not related to increased levels of circulate, um, circulating calcium. He does not have renal failure. There's no evidence of pyelonephritis, um, and so we've got the question now: Is hypercalcemia is it neoplastic disease? So, <clears throat> my little list: anal sac adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, multiple myeloma. Well, he's got no palpable lymph nodes. Could have me just sign lymphoma then. We need to check. Um, he has, uh, uh, and also his um, globulin levels normal. So it means a diagnosed multiple myeloma is almost probably not going to be the case. What endocrine disease can give you hypercalcemia? <clears throat> well, hyperparathyroidism. So if you think about normal physiology, we have the thyroid glands. And within the thyroid, you have the intra and extra capsular parathyroid glands. And they produce PTH or parathyroid hormone. What does PTH do? PTH encourages uh, calcium release from bone. It enhances calcium uptake from the bowel and it reduces calcium excretion through the kidney. Okay, So it's a way of making calcium go up within the circulation. And as with any um, endocrine system in our bodies, there's positive and negative feedback all the time. So our parathyroid hormone levels are going up and down, up and down, up and down, very slightly all the time to keep ionized calcium between 1.1 and 1.4 millimoles per liter. I didn't have an ionized calcium measurement um, by the time I saw Bentley 20 years ago. So I'm just being honest, I had to use total. But now obviously I just reach for an ISTAT um, or an EPOC and, and just get an ionized calcium as quickly as we possibly could. And why is ionized calcium so crucial? is because of its function within skeletal muscle. Every skeletal muscle contraction relies on ionized calcium. So we need to make sure we have enough um, because obviously hypocalcemia is a bad thing to have. And high levels of calcium then interfere with a lot of other cellular processes. So we've got a patient whose clinical signs potentially match hypercalcemia and we've got hypercalcemia confirmed. The other thing is his, high, his um, phosphate was very slightly low. Now, I don't want to make too much of it yet at this stage, but if you've got a disease process where PTH or the neoplastic equivalent PTHRP are up, what the other actions of PTH are to excrete phosphate, okay, so and to drive phosphate levels down. So any, if you've got a blood picture where you've got elevated um, calcium, 
but lower than normal phosphate, it makes me suspicious it's a PTH or PTHRP uh, mediated process. And just while we're here, what is PTHRP? PTHRP is actually a hormone that um, all mammals use uh, in their fetal stage to trigger um, skeletal development. Um, but the gene becomes quiescent just before birth and PTH takes over. So we all have a PTHRP uh, gene in every cell, which is quiescent. Um, but neoplastic cells learn how to express um, uh, that PTHRP gene. Um, and some, the classic ones that make you hypercalcemic, they make it because they manage to switch that gene back on. So what are we going to do now about menu? We've still got a dog at the end of this and we've got to get an answer. So here's my differential. We've got I've been through this neoplasia, hyper, hyperparathyroidism. The other endocrine disease we can't forget about, though, is Addison's disease. Now, Addison's disease um, is originally the paper by Jonathan Elliott um, from the RVC. It reported that um, around about 15 to 20% of, of, of patients with Addison's may present with a mild to moderate hypercalcemia. Um, I think it's going to say, my experience, I don't think that percentage is as high as that, but um, I can instantly think of a, a very famous patient um, at Cambridge Vet School called Boots, when uh, Rich Mellenby, who's now the head of um, at Edinburgh Vet School, uh, and I were on duty one night, and this dog came in, it was an old English sheepdog who had um, a collapse, horrendous hemorrhagic diarrhea, um, and he'd been, re we could still, on ultrasound, we thought we could see some mild lymph um mesenteric lymph node enlargement, we were both absolutely convinced this dog had a GI lymphoma and he was you know, kind of be put to sleep as soon as physically possible. And we thought, well, better do an HDH sim just to check. Um, and he had calcium, I think, from memory that was, it was about 3.8 total and ionized at about 1.7. And sure enough, of course, his HDH stim was, was positive for Addison's disease. And uh, I think we learned a lesson with boots that never discount Addison's even uh, with, with hypercalcemia. Although I would say it's unusual for patients to have um, a total calcium, calcium as high as, as Bentley did with, with Addison's disease. Um, other things that can make you hypercalcemic or chronic renal failure. And I think this is something that causes a little bit of confusion. Um, the vast, vast majority of patients that you and I see in cats and dogs with renal failure will have normal calcium. About 10% uh, will be slightly high and 5% will be slightly low. But um, I think there's certainly a myth with some people that um, chronic renal failure causes hypercalcemia. It, it can, but it's in a very small number of patients. Okay, so, um, and we know he doesn't have renal failure because the bloods we've already done. And last, of course, not this, is that young animals, don't forget dogs who, and cats whose uh, growth plate's not closed will be mildly hypercalcemic. And then we've got some infrequent um, diagnoses, um, which I won't dwell on too much now, but granulomatous inflammation, so uh, macrophage-based inflammation in lymph nodes, which can be, obviously in cats, can be related to TB, uh, but in dogs, it's just an idiopathic thing norm normally um, can make you hypercalcemic. And you've probably seen occasionally these reports in, in the vet record of vet times about pet food being withdrawn because they put too much vitamin D um, in. Uh, the other thing is, though, that if you have humans who have got psoriasis, um, the way one of the treatments for psoriasis is a vitamin D based skin cream. And um, it, it is true, dogs seem to think this tastes lovely. I don't know what is in it, but dogs will often lick um, uh, the psoriasis cream off their owners. If, so <clears throat> hopefully not the owners will let them, but so it's just something to double check that then uh, owners are not using a, a vitamin D based skin cream. So, however, in Bentley, this is where we are. We can rule out renal failure. So, really, we look at neoplasia, Addison's, or hyperparathyroidism, and we can test for those specifically. And I think the way into these is look at the common things are common. So let's test for where can you have neoplasia, the anal sac evaluation. We need to use a radiographs to look if he's got a tumor within his uh, mediastinum. Uh, we need to think about probably abdominal ultrasound. And at the time we didn't have a CT scan or a CT would be an option here, but I'm still a fan of a plain radiograph and an abdominal ultrasound because you could do an FNA of a lesion if you found something on ultrasound at the same time. We're going to need to do an HTH stim to rule out him having um, Addison's, and we could do a PTH and a PTH RP assay to investigate the possibility of hyperparathyroidism and as a belt and braces approach to his um, neoplastic disease. So this is what we did. <clears throat> we did an HTH stim, and uh, his pre-stim was less than 20, but his post-stim result was 380, which is completely consistent with normal adrenal gland function. So if you think about an Addisonian patient has no adrenal reserve, so classic would be less than 20, less than 20. 
Um, we did chest threads and abdominal radiographs. They were unremarkable. His abdominal sound was unremarkable. But here we are as PTH and PTHRP. And normal dogs should have no PTHR or PTHRP, sorry, detectable, which was the case with Bentley. But his PTH level is nearly double normal. So very, this is totally supportive of him having hyperparathyroidism. Then the question is, is it primary or is it secondary? And secondary uh, hyperparathyroidism can always be secondary to uh, nutritional abnormalities or to renal failure. Well, we know he hasn't got renal failure. So um, uh, I went back and quizzed the owners on, on what they feed him and they were feeding him a proprietary food and actually feeding raw canning at the time. <clears throat> and I thought nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism was going to be unlikely. Um, however, you can use ultrasound to help differentiate because if you've got nutritional or secondary hyperparathyroidism, you will see enlargement of the parathyroids in plural. If you've got primary hyperparathyroidism, then you're going to see enlargement of just one hyperparathyroid. So here we are, gone through our differential list. It's about the problem list. The differential list is really helpful. We've ruled it down that he must have hyperparathyroidism, which I suspect at the moment is primary, but we need to do just one other thing to see if we can make sure. We need some ultrasound. And ultrasound is brilliant. Um, uh, you need to be a little bit practiced and experience this. And, um, and this is a really interesting picture. I look at this. This uh, is taken by someone who I would rate as probably one of Britain's very top veterinary ultrasonographers. But this is 20 years ago. Um, and I think it's fair to say quality of ultrasound has improved in 20 years. Um, so we did an ultrasound of his neck, um, uh, or Paddy did one for me. And what we were able to see was one single little hypoechoic mass in the right parathyroid and the left parathyroid looked completely normal. So the thyroid, and, and there was no associated parathyroid masses within that. So by definition here, now we have reached a definitive diagnosis. He has got one single nodule in his right parathyroid. This is consistent with primary hyperparathyroidism, causing hypercalcemia, which has caused the PUPD and inappetence. So everything ties up really, really nicely. So what are we going to do about it? Well, the most commonly practiced treatment is surgical excision of the affected gland. And um, it, what we were just in the habit of doing at the time is giving so quite high rates of fluid therapy. Um, so very lazy, just giving him three to four times maintenance for about 48 hours before surgery. And this has two aims, really. Number one is to lower the level of circulating calcium slightly with a diuretic effect. And we thought at the time this is also renoprotective, um, high calcium, and actually not so much high calcium, but high PTH is renotoxic. It's why renal diets work. Um, you have a low protein, low calcium based food, um, which then lowers levels of PTH in patient renal failure. And then that reduces the rate of progression of the renal um, disease. So this is the Delzamim is on a lot of fluids and boy, oh boy, did he pee an awful lot when he's on four times maintenance. But uh, that's what we did. We took him to surgery and this is his, um, this is actually his parathyroid um, that uh, Prof White removed for me. Uh, very small. He made a brilliant recovery from surgery and we sent up histo and it came back to be a parathyroid adenoma. So a benign tumor of his thyroid parathyroid. And that's good news because what should happen in these patients is that they should make a complete recovery without any um, long-term consequences whatsoever. However, you need to think about normal physiology when it comes to the uh, post-operative recovery of patients like Bentley, because when you've got high PTH levels being produced by one parathyroid, the other parathyroids physiologically shut down and atrophy. And it takes about, um, it's a bit like if you, um, you know, sudden withdrawal of, 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 of glucocorticoids, for example, a high dose of PRED, sudden withdrawal, there's that slight risk of, of having a, an acute adenosine crisis because the adrenal glands have actually physiologically um, shut down. And the other parathyroids are exactly the same. So you need to support patients like Bentley for no more normal than five days, maybe seven, to make sure the calcium absolute levels do not drop drastically low. So the way we do that it was used the active form of vitamin D or 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Comes a little capsule, Rocaltrol. And uh, so we just gave him, normally just starts on the night, um, as soon as the first meal after surgery. <coughs> and the, the protocol is we monitor the ionized calcium twice a day. So we borrowed, I think, from memory, an ionized calcium monitor from, from the vet school. And um, what you'd normally expect is that the ionized calcium, will, it will do normally, it might go very it normally just normalizes over about two to five days. It might go too low, in which case you need to give 
supplementary uremia is calcium and more vitamin D. Um, but we were, I was quite happy. And anyway, got to day six and uh, he's still up. Day seven, his ionized calcium was still double normal. So I was thinking, well, that's not the plan. Maybe I'm overdosing his vitamin D. So I stopped the vitamin D altogether. I'm thinking, that's fine. At this point, Prof White's not overly chuffed with me. And this one, I remember Bentley had some fairly challenging conversations in, in wards that, 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 uh, over these days. Um, and I did start to worry when we got to day 12 post-surgery. So five days out of vitamin D because his ionized calcium was still double normal. And I came to the conclusion, whoa, we've got a problem. There must be something else going on here. And this is when the problem-based medicine approach works. What you do is you go back to your differential diagnosis or create a new problem list. In this case, the problem is the same as hypercalcemia. So you go back to our differential diagnosis. List. What could possibly be going on to make, make Bentley maintain his hypercalcemic status? And this is the same list. Has he got cancer somewhere we've missed? Distinct possibility, I thought. Uh, did I miss Addison's? Don't think so. That's, that's impossible, really. Um, could he still be hyperparathyroid? Well, not really. We've removed the source of the problem, I would have thought. Um, but we need to investigate that. So, uh, and could he also have concurrently one of the more unusual things? Actually, have I overdone the vitamin D? Possibly at the time, but the half-life, um, so metab metabolic rate of 125 dihydroxyvitamin D is it's normally out of the system within 24 hours. So I didn't think that was going to be the case. And could it be a lab error? Almost certainly not, because we're doing it twice a day. So what we're going to do, the best way forward for this, if you look at a differential list, is if you've got neoplasia and primary parathyroidism, if we repeat the PTH to PTHRP, we should get an answer, which is what we did. And what to uh, somewhat uh, disgruntlement, the PTH was still markedly elevated. So that's telling me he's got hyperparathyroidism still. So what we did, we repeated the ultrasound and we found he had a nodule on the, on the other side, the left-hand side. And we went back and looked at the previous images and there was absolutely definitely no nodule there at all. I say this ultrasonography is truly brilliant. So we took it to surgery and this took this one out and this was shown to be a carcinoma. Okay. And then Bentley did exactly what we expected and uh, his calcium went back to normal and uh, within actually four days and he remained completely well. And I, I lost him to follow up about three years later. Um, but so that's how it was. So initially, what seems to be a very straightforward, simple case, um, but actually had a little twist in the tail. But using problem orientated medicine, we managed to go, hang on, stay calm. What could possibly be causing this? Let's test for that specifically. And we found an answer. And uh, so I now saw, but I must have bent the in about the March of 2004. And to this day, I've still not seen a dog uh, with two different pathologies causing hyperparathyroidism almost at exactly the same time. And I think what happened here was he genuinely did have a microscopic carcinoma in the left-hand side that just wasn't visible. But by the time we imaged it two weeks later, it was then visible as the, um, and maybe there was a bit of suppression in its growth from the PTH from the other side. I don't know, never be able to prove that. But anyway, I hope that's a, a helpful case. So let's move on. And something gets good. Uh, second case I want to talk today is, is Honey. And Honey is uh, or, uh, was a 10 year old at the time, new to female Labrador, lovely uh, yellow Labrador. And she got referred to me for investigation of what they thought was insulin resistance because the vet had done a really great job. She'd been diagnosed with diabetes uh, mellitus three months previously. Uh, the vet had done a nice workup and uh, got her on to can insulin. I started at 0.5 units per kilo twice a day and gradually got up to 0.7 over about a two-week period. And she seemed quite stable and the vet sent me over a nice glucose curve um, and she looked really quite good at that. They advised to be feed her, I think it was raw cannon at the time, diabetic diet. Um, and it, whatever your views on prescription diets are, the diabetic diets do help um, as finesse glycemic control. I think there's no toys about that. And they'd been very happy with her management. But after um, a couple of months, so two, two and a half months of treatment, the PUPD that um, Honey had initially presented with started to return. So the frame rat did a, a blood curve, a glucose curve, and showed it wasn't as good a response as before. So gradually increased the unit uh, of, of insulin such that they ended up doubling the dose over a period of four weeks so that we were up to 1.4 units per kilo. And she was still really quite markedly PUPD. Um, 
and the vet had noticed that there was that they'd, been, they'd only been saying this hair coat change and then uh, there was really quite a marked hair coat change over a period of about four weeks and it was this combination of things that made him refer her on so what do i mean by hair coat change well before we did this was the uh, glucose curve we did <clears throat> and so i wanted to say and if you've got a patient that's not stable on diabetes but let's do that sentence again rob if you've got a diabetic patient who isn't stable and doesn't seem to be responding as well a glucose curve either good old-fashioned one of just taking a glucose on every hour or possibly using an interstitial fluid glucose monitor uh, will help us work out if the insulin is working at all and i think it's fair to say um, if you look here we've got a blood glucose curve on on, on the x-axis and uh, she's not responding to the insulin at all whereas before she was responding really nicely. So there's definitely something here. And uh, although true insulin resistance is, is defined by giving more than 2.2 units per kilo of insulin um, each injection and not seeing a response, we've clearly got a problem with honey here because honey was responding beautifully to half this dose a couple of months ago. So here she is, very, very uh, lovely dog. Uh, she was a real sweetheart as well, just a lovely, lovely dog. Um, and uh, when we examined it, she looks fairly got a clip patch on her neck there from, from the blood samples, which hadn't regrown from the referring vet, um, and a clip patch um, on her abdomen from, from an ultrasound scan. But when we looked, uh, I looked at her and went, wow, this is quite marked skin change because she had alopecia. It wasn't classic flank, it was actually on, on her dorsum. Um, it wasn't truly symmetrical, but it was present on both the left and right hand sides to some degree. And when you also, I thought her skin looked thinner than normal. Okay, and this is actually her ventral abdomen. And what you can see, and I apologize, I don't have a pointer, um, but what you can see um, uh, just at sort of eight o'clock on seven to eight o'clock here is that's her spay scar, which you can see suddenly looks really quite well, almost like it might open up again. You can see the skin, the, the um, subcutaneous veins and vessels in the skin. So this is skin that is definitely thinner than normal. And that's, I think, going to be quite important. And when you look close up at her skin, it had a, a sort of slightly nodular, bumpy appearance. It almost looked like little white heads um, present in the skin. But if you tried to squeeze these, then they weren't full of permanent material or sebum. Uh, they were actually quite solid. And I was starting to suspect that this could be calcinosis cutis. I didn't know at this stage, but that's it. Or it could be an, uh, the differential obviously would be, is this a pilo, sorry, a, um, a, a, a so sort of superficial dermatitis and a pyoderma. So at this stage, not sure. So back to what we had for case one when we talked about Bentley. Just want you to think to yourself, what do you think is wrong and what would you like to do? Hopefully this one isn't maybe quite as, uh, as, uh, as difficult as before. So just have a look. What do you want to do is the key. If you think you know what's wrong, how are you going to get there? And what else? might be wrong is something we need to think about so hopefully what you said you're going to do is you're going to make a problem list and i'm afraid there's going to be a repeated mantra here guys that we're going to say if you don't know what to do we'll make a problem list we'll construct a differential diagnosis list and then we'll proactively test to see what we think is going on so my problem was that she had problem list is that she previously had previously well controlled diabetes mellitus but it now doesn't seem to be very well controlled and she's PUPD and I didn't say earlier, so she's polyphagic. She's got non-pruritic abdominal neoplasia um, and so on the dorsum there, you've seen that. And there seems to be thinning of eventual abdominal skin. So what could be the thing, potential causes of that? Well, if you're looking and if ever you have a patient um, and I hope these general lists are really helpful for you in, in lots of the patients you'll see um, in the future. What can make a, a dog resistant to their insulin? And the first thing is an infection. Bacterial infections, particularly UTIs and pyelonephritis, can cause really quite marked reduction in the efficacy of insulin. And if you've got a patient who is glucosuric, patients with diabetes mellitus are very prone to developing urinary tract infections. So this is your number one place to go and look, okay? Get a urine sample. And I should have said it earlier with Bentley, um, if you're looking for urinary tract infection, obviously a cystocentesis sample is the gold standard. But um, that's not always very easy. And I know sometimes it can seem a bit scary. If you go take a catheter sample, the problem is that there is a risk that you may introduce any contaminant bacteria on the edge of the prepuce or the vulva into the bladder 
and therefore contaminate your sample. So you have to completely sterilely prepare um, the prep use or the vulva if you're going to do a catheterized sample. So actually what I would do if I can't or somebody don't want to do a cysto, midstream free catch urine sample into a sterile container has been shown to be almost as good as a cystocentesis sample. So as a quick guide for owners, or you get an owner, if you're in practice, you just answer the if your nurse can just take the dog fork, or you want to take the dog fork um, with a sterile uh, kidney dish and just kind of midstream, don't get the first bit because obviously there'll be contamination, but midstream free catch sample, you can use that to analyze for urinary tract infections. Particularly if you don't find anything, then you know that urine is truly sterile. The second thing I would always think of, though, in terms of what can cause insulin resistance is inflammation. And, and I remember um, one of my very first cases, my very first diabetic dog in practice, it was a Weimaraner, um, owned by a lovely couple. And, uh, and, and as often the case, the man himself was diabetic. And uh, this was a female dog who developed metestrous diabetes. So um, I made the diagnosis and we stabilized her uh, initially just at that, that causal season. Um, and uh, we, we got a, a diabetes reasonable under control. And I then went on holiday and, and uh, a good locum uh, came and spayed her. Um, and I thought that was going to be the end of the problem. And I came back from holiday and she was initially doing very well. But about four weeks after this, she became uh, PUPD again and I found her to be hyperglycemic. I thought, okay, well, what I was taught at the RVC is that uh, you can have beta violet exhaustion um, from uh, uh, when we've had a metastasis diabetes. And so I just started on insulin and gradually over about six months was ramping the insulin dose up and up and up. And I could not get this dog under control whatsoever. And this is back in uh, 1996. Yeah, the dark ages. My, my kids would tell me that's ancient history and were the dinosaurs around dad probably. But we didn't have an ops machine. So we did radiographs. I couldn't see anything and um, didn't have a great x-ray machine. I think without being rude from any one of my previous practices, if you're uh, listening. Um, but I ended up deciding to advise my boss to do an X-lap and because um, I couldn't find anything else. And what we found was there was a swab left behind in the at the site of the ovarian pedicle and uh, that inflammatory response was causing the ancient resistance and uh, removal of that uh, was can, um, did actually manage to get the dog diabetes under control she remained diabetic forever um, but we did manage to get it. And I've never forgotten that that little dog um, that it's not in the textbooks but uh, particularly surgical farm bodies um, if you've done a spay it, have it on your list that it's something that hopefully doesn't happen but it's a possibility so infection though is the main one or marked inflammation your second major differential diagnosis is a concurrent endocrinopathy and the major two think about are cushing's disease complicated diabetes and hypothyroidism in dogs particularly complicating hypo um, complicating uh, diabetic management um the third thing that could cause is neoplasia any neoplasia particularly malignant neoplasia will cause insulin resistance um, so they're my, actually the major things I think of if I've got a dog that's not responding and I've proved it's insulin resistant, this is my differential diagnosis list. Some of the textbooks will tell you insulin resi true insulin resistance, um, antibody mediated resistance and true stress, but I'm not sure now in, in 2022 that we, we believe either those do cause re significant insulin resistance. So infection, concurrent endocrinopathy and neoplasia are my major three. So I've already said, have I proved there's genuine insulin resistance in, in honey? The answer is no, but I'm convinced there's another endocrinopathy going on. So what would be a differential diagnosis for non protic flank alopecia? And fundamentally, there are, are probably two major ones, which are Cushing's and hypothyroidism. I put alopecia X in there, uh, but that's, yeah, okay, you may have click related, but we, we'll put that to one side at the moment, but Cushing's and hypothyroidism. So how can we tell the difference? Both cause non protic bilaterally symmetrical alopecia, potentially. The difference between the two conditions is the change in the skin. And Cushing's causes um, uh, movement uh, and mobilization of the subcutaneous fat levels, oh, subcutaneous fat layers, sorry, away from the skin. Actually deposits the mesentery and, and around the liver, which is why one of the reasons why you get the pendulous abdomen. So whereas hypothyroidism, if it causes skin change at all, will generally cause thickening to some degree, not massively, but thickening of the skin. What you don't get with hypothyroidism is thinning. And you get a slightly greasy appearance, um, sometimes as well in some comedones. But with Cushing's, obviously, you can get calcinosis cutis. And obviously, honey's skin potentially did look like that. So 
um, for me, um, what I was what I was going to do was think, well, what do we think we need to do? Well, we need to rule in or rule out the way she's got a urinary tract infection because she could have three problems here. She could have Cushing's and diabetes, and she's then got double whammy effect of why she might have a UTI. But if I'm going to get a urine sample, remember I said within Bentley when, that, that uh, patients with Cushing's often have very high protein to creatinine ratios. So may as well have a look at the proteinuria. Um, if she's got a UTI, I don't know how to interpret the UPCR because UTIs elevate the, pro the proteinuria, but it just may as well have a look while we're there. Now, if you've got Cushing's, though, we need to test for that. And the question is, what test are you going to do? <laughs> and I, I'm well aware that most of us will probably just jump for an ACH stim in, in practice for routine diagnosis of Cushing's. But I think it's true to say that as a general rule, a low dose DEX test is the better test as a screening test for Cushing's. Um, it's got a higher sensitivity and, and it, it, you're going to get, you're going to pick up more cases and have fewer false negatives. There is a problem though, that when you look at sensitivity and specificity of diagnostic tests, it might change depending on the situation that you are in. And when you're testing for Cushing's disease, if you've got a, another disease present, Actually, what we need is we see something that's really good, got really high specificity. We want to make sure that there's no, that if the patient doesn't have the disease, it definitely doesn't have it um, because then we're not going to treat something uh, inappropriately. So actually, the general advice is that you can use a low-dose DEX, but if you've got what you suspect a concurrent disease alongside the Cushing's, diabetes, neoplasia, there's going to be causing stress. And HTH stim actually is probably the better test to do. And how, if you want to, so just going off the topic a bit actually of, of, of endocrinology for a minute, how can you remember what the difference between sensitivity and specificity is? I struggle with this, maybe I'm a bit thick, but um, sensitivity is a mark of reflection of the true positives. So if you're a positive result, if it, it's truly got the disease. And specificity is a mark of the true negatives. So you can, a negative result means you truly got it, truly doesn't have it, sorry. So if you turn that on its head, if you've got high specificity, if it's positive, it's almost certainly got the disease. So spin, specificity, specificity, spin, rule in. Okay, so high specificity helps you rule in the disease because if it's got a negative result, you know it doesn't have it. And snout, rule out, sensitivity, um, S and N. If, it's, uh, if you've got, um, if you get a negative result with a high sensitivity, then you can rule that disease out, whereas um, because that's if it's a reflection number of true positives so just a thing so what we're doing is you could do either test go back to <clears throat> honey but as in this situation low dose dex is probably the best thing to do the question i often get asked and do a lot of vice calls on is well, what about t4 and tsh if i'm not sure and, and the answer we've got here is this dog has got diabetes not very well controlled so it's highly likely that she'll have actually a degree of sick youth thyroid syndrome where the t4 will be slightly depressed because of a general metabolic status so I'm not going to do just a normal T a T4 on its own anyway. Secondly, though, her signs are much more consistent with Cushing's because she's got thinning of the skin, not thickening of the skin. She's got what I suspect, to be, and I end up proving eventually calcinosis cutis on a biopsy. So my decision was we're going to look for UTI and we're going to look for Cushing's consistently at the same time and see if we can find an answer. So here's a urinalysis. Um, she, I want to, if there's ketones, there's no ketones. She's got three plus glucose. The USG allegedly is 1022. Well, that's normal, but be careful. It's not normal at all. Glucose has refractile properties. So if you've got glucose urea, your USG will always be falsely higher than it actually is. And if you could measure, if you look at, you probably don't yourself, if you look at the urine from a diabetic dog, it looks really pale. And then USG says it's higher than it should be. And that's because, as I say, the glucose dissolved in it causes refractile changes on, on your refractometer. If you could measure the osmolarity, it would be low. She's got three plus protein, um, which again, could be consistent with a urinary tract infection. Um, and actually when we measure the urine protein creatinine ratio it is massive, 16.2. Now that certainly you'd expect there to be elevations of urinary protein in a urinary tract infection, and she's got one plus positive white cells. But 16.2, is a little higher than I, would expect, I was expecting it to be. And 16, certainly in the teens, is something you quite often see with patients with Cushing disease, and it will completely resolve to normal when you control the disease, okay? So what we've got here is it looks like we've got, uh, a sedum exam, we've definitely got MSF for UTI. So um, we've got 
potentially a couple of problems here uh, going on. So we will, what are we going to do? We do an HTH stim and she's got a positive result. Okay. So what we've got is we've got Cushing's and um, diabetes together. So what we need to do is work out what sort of Cushing's, is it pituitary or um, uh, adrenal, because that's always going to depend on the treatment. And what's the easiest way to do that? Well, the easiest way to do that is actually do an ultrasound. Um, we can do high dose DEX tests, we can do um, endogenous ACH, but the simplest way to do it is just to do an ultrasound. Possibly a CT, but ultrasound is cheaper, quicker, and easier. And what we're looking for is asymmetry between the left and the right hand side. If you think about pituitary dependent Cushing's, we should have bilateral adrenal enlargement. If you've got an adrenal tumor, you're going to have an asymmetry between the left and the right hand side. Um, I think we all have the impression if you've got an adrenal dependent Cushing's, the contralateral side shrinks to nothing. It doesn't. They physiologically atrophy, but physically they only atrophy partly. So simplest thing to do here <clears throat> is to just do an abnormal ultrasound. And if you've got bilateral enlargement, bef and this is important before you put them on trilostane, if you uh, ultrasound a patient on trilostane, the adrenals get bigger because of the trilostane. Okay, so, um, so that's what we did with her. And she had bilateral adrenal enlargement. So what we diagnosed her to do is that she had developed Cushing's disease on top of the diabetes. Interesting question, did she have Cushing's before? And actually that's normally the way thought happens is that Cushing's disease causes insulin resistance, and, uh, um, but uh, with concurrent diabetes. So what are we gonna do? Well, the problem we've got is that the endogenous steroids cause insulin resistance, okay? So what we need to do is we need to get that insulin resistance down by reducing the steroid doses, uh, sorry, the endogenous steroid levels, and the best way to do that, obviously, is with, we, is with veteril. However, if we can get the steroid levels down, her elevated insulin dose is going to potentially make her go hypoglycemic. So what I would do with all these patients is start trying to say standard dose and do standard monitoring, but straight away reduce your insulin dose by 25% and just monitor for ketones in the urine. Okay. Give the endless instruction what hypoglycemia looks like, but generally, they don't generally go hypoglycemic. So what we did with Honey um, is that we started on just on 60 mg of trilostane. She was a 28 kilo dog. We gave her amoxicillin for the staph urinary tract infection and reduced the insulin dose back to 1.1 units. And what happened was within a week, um, and this is, I would say this is classic for these patients, normally it's within one to two weeks, if you get the trilostane dose right, they'll actually stabilize really generally very, very well. And um, we managed to show on the stage stim that she had a, a nice response and the blood glucose curve, not perfect, but showed that she was having a much better response. So this is how to manage a patient with diabetic cushion noise. They sound really scary, but they're not really. You've got to get the trial stain on board, um, if it's pituitary dependent, obviously. Lower your insulin dose by about 25%, and then monitor really carefully. Um, and they generally will do quite well. Okay. So just while we're here, how do you investigate an, an unstable diabetic? Because these, I think, are the, some of the most complicated calls that we get. And the, um, most diabetics should be able to be stabilized really very well. But before we jump into um, glucose curve, just have a sit down chat with the owners. Are they handling the insulin properly? So have they got it um, yet just in the door of their fridge? Don't put it at the back of the top of the fridge where it will often get stuck to the back wall and freeze because freezing insulin kills it completely. Um, are they gently rolling it in its bottle? If you shake insulin consistently, insulin is a delicate little um, sort of molecule with two disulfide bonds and it, you'll break those bonds apart and if it's structurally not int intact it won't work um, make sure they can actually inject properly um, they're not going in one side and out the other um, so just though you know and do a do good physical examination can you find obvious evidence of the resistance but if you're not we've already said the major things of course resistance would be infection inflammation concurrent endocrinopathy and we can go looking for that um, with those things without a problem um, so what you overswing is something that uh, I think a lot of people worry about, but actually it very rarely, the only time it happens is if you or I increase insulin dose far too quickly. Okay, so my general rule is I will not change insulin dose more than once every three to four days. And you're doing it by uh, so one to two, um, so point one to point two units at max each time. So that's how I'd investigate an unstable diabetic, quiz the owners, and then um, careful examination of the, of the injection site. So I should have said that if you've got fibrosis at the injection site, because they're using the same spot all the time, obviously insulin is going to, absorption is going to be poor. Make sure they're feeding the dog as you've asked them to feed it. But if that's not their case, then go looking for infection, 
concurrent endocrinopathy, neoplasia, and that's the workup plan that we have. Okay. Um, hi, hi, Rob. I just wanted to, to jump in and say um, it's already 8.30, which is uh, unbelievable. <laughs> It's been super, super interesting, but um, I know it's it's a, a long evening for people after a long yeah, sure. day in clinics on a very, very warm day. So um, we might need to keep uh, your other cases for another day, but I don't want you to rush through them and, and waste them because I know you spent um, a lot of time preparing them and they're so, so interesting and actually go, going through everything. But I would love if there were any questions for anybody, from anybody, if perhaps we could get through some of those. Yeah, um, pleasure, of course. If, if, if that was okay. Um, so if anybody does have any questions, please do pop them pop them in the, in the chat box and I can get them through to Rob. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely don't want to keep people <laughs> too late. We might have to do a part two, Rob um where uh where okay. we do where we run through everything else because it's been it's been fantastic and i um <laughs> yeah <laughs> isabel says yes to a a part two and, and marie says please let him carry on so i'm i'm split <laughs> well should we do should we do one more and if i do it in 15 minutes and then we could do um so let's do and anyone needs to leave for urgent sustenance i understand completely um so which one shall we do yeah uh, pick pick your favorite one and perhaps we can we can run through it we can run through it quickly and then um if anyone out if anyone needs to leave please please do and well, sure. uh, it will be we, all recorded <laughs> we won't Great, do, and we'll do we'll we do won't do one. sam um because uh i won't give sam away sam's a fascinating patient but um uh, you'll, keep, you'll keep us all in suspense on Sam. Well, Sam's also <laughs> one of my all-time favourite patients because he's a little dog that we think we did the first treatment ever in the world um, on him with some gene therapy. So let me um, let's do let's do one little cat to finish. Now again, um, so Topsy is a little uh, nine-year-old cat. Now I, I first saw Topsy actually about two thousand five, um, working up and worked up with Ed Friend, who some of you may know is one of the surgeons down at Bristol. Ed and I were at Cambridge together. And we used to work in Bayswater, and I owe you all apology. I I, I don't have a picture of Topsy to share and I think it's a real shame but Topsy was a um, really interesting cat who uh, presented or she presented sorry with two month history um, being lethargic um, not being quite herself but it was intermittent but it was getting worse and worse and the biggest concern for the owner was um, it was an indoor cat only from central London and she wouldn't jump up on the sofa to sit on the owner's knee um, and the owner also thought she's drinking much more than normal didn't see herself okay um, and I always thought that she would sort of stand in an odd position. And when I quizzed her, what she, she kept saying, well, I think her head's looking down and she just doesn't seem to want to look up at me very much. That was what she said. OK, so what are your thoughts? What would you want to do? We've got a patient who is PUPD, a bit dull lethargic, but isn't really as mobile as normal. Um, and uh, it, it certainly isn't doing... Um, isn't doing what you're doing. Just look at the questions. There's one on hypercalcemia. I'll come back to answer about hypercalcemia. I'll make sure I know, make a note of that on timings. Okay. So what are we going to do um, for, for, for this little cat? Okay. So what I found was that in, um, uh, she was basically had a plantar growth stance. So back legs dropped a little bit. And some of you may say, oh, she's got diabetes because it was certainly on my mind at that stage, but certainly may have a peripheral neuropathy of some sort. And she had a head, her neck was ventral flex down. Um, but otherwise, she was fairly unremarkable. So, what do you want to do? I hope you're going to go, uh, the, it should be loud clamoring. So, write a problem list, because we're right a problem list, okay. So, she's PUPD to some degree, certainly drinking more than normal. I haven't quantified it yet. So, we've got the same list we've got before, endocrine versus non-endocrine. Lethargy and reduced strength, though. Mm, cool. Diabetes would fit, chronic renal failure would fit with that, but could it? So funnily, I'm looking at, have I got a musculoskeletal disease here, um, a neuropathy of some sort, or have I got a metabolic disease that's damaging her ability to move around? She got a plantar growth stance, and that certainly would suggest a peripheral neuropathy. And uh, absolutely, I think most of us probably go, oh, diabetes causes that, doesn't it? And the answer is absolutely it could. And if she's got a peripheral neuropathy in her legs, she could have a neuropathy affecting her head carriage as well. But ventral of the neck 
can cause can be caused classically with hypokalemia, low potassium levels, which could be linked to chronic renal failure, could be linked to diabetes, or it could be linked to this thing that um, if any of you um, sort of my generation sat the cert, Sam, it was one of those horrible questions, what, what is Cons syndrome? And I remember reading that going, not, not sure at the time. Um, potassium, if you remember, one of the ways we control potassium is through aldosterone. So if you've got too much aldosterone, you'll have low levels of potassium. So this is my very basic problem list. So um, what are we going to do? We're going to get some urine, first of all, to see if we can investigate. And actually, her urine concentration wasn't too bad. Um, maybe slightly subnormal for a cat, but, but otherwise, no evidence of anything. Certain diabetes is not present. and She didn't have evidence of a urinary tract infection. So second thing we could do, we could do bloods. And what we ask in the bloods tell us, we ask the bloods tell us, is there renal failure? Is there diabetes? What's going on with her electrolytes? Have I got evidence of elevated CK or something that would indicate there's some sort of problem within her musculoskeletal system? Okay, so those are the questions I was asking. Have I got on the CBC any evidence of a neoplastic infiltrate? Again, when some of this could be called things this we had before. And actually, if I look into this, well, urea, maybe urea is slightly up, but the creatinine is actually normal. So we've got a pre-renal picture here, mild pre-renal, 11.1 I'm not worried about. What are the two most common causes of pre-renal azotemia? It's dehydration and low-grade gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Okay, and I interpret this at the moment as probably this is mild dehydration rather than anything else. Um, ALK, FOS and ALT are normal. Um, glucose is normal, so she isn't diabetic. We can rule that out. So let's have a look at electrolytes and well, hey, here we are. <laughs> so we've got sodium that is high normal. Potassium, though, that is actually really quite worryingly low. 2.0 is probably half what it should normally be. Um, phosphate and calcium are okay. Now, the other thing that uh, instantly I was worried about was that um, uh, patients who have got con syndrome, um, if that was what she has, and I'm suspicious that she has, are normally quite hypertensive. And so we're measuring systolic blood pressure. And sure enough, um, she had a, a really quite worrying only high blood pressure at 205. And some patients with, with, with con syndrome can actually present uh, with blindness because of retinal disease. So we had a look at retinas and uh, sure enough, you'll see just on the left-hand side, nine o'clock here, we've got evidence of retinal hemorrhage. Um, and there's certainly that vessel on the right looks larger than normal and a little more tortuous. So this is a retina consistent appearance with, with hypertension. So what have we got? We've got, you can look at our differential list. We've not got any evidence of, of, of diabetes. We've got no evidence of, of, of um, uh, chronic renal failure. And our abnormalities are hypokalemia with high normal sodium and hypertension. So what are we going to do? Let's make a differential diagnosis list for what can cause hyperkalemia. And you can just get these out of textbooks. You don't need to remember this. You know, this is something going, I now know what I'm going to go look up. So what can cause hyperkalemia? No one would be reduced intake. OK, um, poor diet. The one that I would urge you to be, I'm sure you do, Eddie, but be really careful about is if you have an inappetent cat in your clinic and you put it on fluids and or you give it frisimide, potassium can drop like a like an absolute stone. OK, so be really careful if inappetent cats on fluids, you need to be monitoring their potassium really closely. So second cause of hyper Kalima can be, um, uh, so hypo, I've got a typo there, haven't I? We missed this, Ellie. There's a, it's not different for hyperkalima, it's different for hypokalima. Everyone, I'm very sorry. Um, increased renal, increased loss. So renal failure, diabetic acidosis. Patients with DKA drop their potassium really, really quickly. We then give them insulin, which makes the potassium drop even further, even more quickly. So in, in a DKA patient, I monitor the potassium every six hours. That's how much we need to monitor. Okay. Um, and you can get translocation into the interspelled space with, with insulin or by car treatment. But what we've got here is this question of CONS syndrome or excessive amounts of aldosterone in the system. <clears throat> so those were then ruled out these out. Those are my metabolic acidosis, alkalosis. Her chloride was high ish, normal, so mishy alkalotic, maybe. That's something you need to look at. So Con syndrome is hyperaldosteronism. And what is caused by most cases, it's something we see in cats. I've never seen it in dog. It's been reported, but I've never seen it. It's caused by a unilateral aldosterone producing tumor of the adrenal cortex on one side. There are now one or two reports of cats with bilateral adrenal cortical hyperplasia, but, but I don't think we really understand what's going on in these patients. So for most of us, Con syndrome is going to be caused by a unilateral adrenal tumor in the cat. The tumors of the cortex and is producing aldosterone. 
So what does aldosterone do? This is probably the second year horrendous physiology. But if you remember, um, your kidneys are constantly measuring blood pressure. And if blood pressure drops, it, they produce renin. And renin goes to and converts angiotensin, which is made by the liver, to angiotensin 1, which then in the lungs, particularly with ACE, um, gets converted to angiotensin 2. And what does angiotensin 2 do? It has two functions. It causes vasoconstriction, and it triggers the adrenal cortex to make aldosterone. And aldosterone then acts to reabsorb sodium in the, uh, in the tubules, particularly the, the distal convoluted tubule, at the expense of potassium. And when you absorb sodium, you absorb water through osmosis and you restore your blood pressure. Okay, so that's the physiology. But one of the functions of aldosterone is to drive potassium out of the bloodstream um, through the kidneys. So if you have too much aldosterone, you lose your potassium. So diagnosed aldosteronism therefore requires inappropriate low potassium, high sodium, I apologize for my dog barking in the background, um, and low plasma renin. I'm just gonna close this door. So what we need to do is we need to see, can we, we can measure aldosterone concentrates, but not very easy. But what we best thing to do is, can we find evidence of unilateral mass? So get us what, see to your ultrasound, we found a mass on ultrasound. So I was happy just to put everything together that we've got all the trumpets I need to make a diagnosis of con syndrome. So what can we do about it? Well, the first thing we do is we think about how does spinal lactone work? Spinal lactone is a potassium sparing um, uh, diuretic and it works by, guess what? And antagonize aldosterone. So the first thing we do with these patients, stick them on aldosterone, uh, so spinal lactone straight away. And that will help reduce some excessive loss and help put on some adenolipine as well. We can help reduce the blood pressure. So we started um, a topsy on, on spinal lactone, those are the doses there, and we gave potassium supplementation in the fluids. Um, and then the key is we've got to go and remove this adrenal gland. So um, we've got some, little, I'm, I am the world's worst surgeon, guys. So I'm definitely not going to talk you through surgical pictures here, but these things are tiny. So what I've got picture on the left here is, is the um, uh, edge just identifying um, the, the adrenal gland here. And here we are actually just gently bring it out. And these are um, little um, forceps, just to give an idea, these things are not big. And probably um, we could have got this far with VVS, um, getting you through these, these uh, to this point of making the diagnosis. Whether you feel happy to do the surge or not, obviously is something that we be up to you. Referral for this is, I wouldn't necessarily think is the wrong thing to do. And this is a brilliant soft tissue surgeon doing the surgery um, today. So, and what we done, um, and that actually, sorry, I've just jumped ahead there. That actually was what we did, we, and she made a complete recovery. Um, so uh, that was a, a bit of a whistle stop through two cons, but they're fascinating cases. You don't see them very often, but the ventral, ventral, ventral flexure of the neck is a really quite a key sign, and it generally happens in cats who are, who are middle-aged. Um, so I'll, I'll just, read, um, there's a little question um, about how do we treat hypercalcemia? Um, uh, <laughs> The ultimate cause, the ultimate answer is you've got to find the underlying cause. Okay. What are you doing while you're waiting? The simplest thing to do in practice is give them intravenous fluids. Okay. Because intravenous fluids at indicated three to four times maintenance, A, will help protect the kidneys um, from any uh, calcinosis of the kidneys and the tubules. Secondly, um, it will actually help a dilution effect and help reduce um, the, the, the calcium within the, within the serum while you're waiting. Bisphosphonates, you can use bisphosphonates. Um, I've had variable success. Um, the second and third generation injectable bisphosphonates are, are good, but they do then bind to the, um, to the bone for about two to four weeks. So I would generally um, you, avoid using those. The other drug that will definitely reduce uh, calcium levels are steroids. Okay, if you give steroids, that will normally reduce serum calcium. However, I would urge you only do that if you are certain the patient doesn't have lymphoma. Okay, or it doesn't matter if you do it doesn't or it does or it doesn't because they're not going to treat because as soon as you give a patient steroids and it's got lymphoma, obviously it may go into remission and then you can't diagnose it. But when it comes back, it's highly likely to be um, resistant to other treatments. Okay, so um, I would say that's the treatment for me. I would do treatment fluids, um, maybe bisphosphonates, but find the cause steroids only if you absolutely have to. Um, there were just a couple of other questions, Rob, that we can yeah. quickly whiz through. Um, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And thank you for everyone for, for, for staying around and, and listening. It was 
it was really excellent. Um, so just a quick question about that last case. Is that your standard dose for cons cats of spironolactone or is that just pre-surgery? Yeah, I would. I, so, I mean, ideally, uh, Kelly, thanks for the question. I, ideally, you would take these patients to surgery. OK, um, if you and I would use that pre-surgery and then as soon as the cat's um, out of surgery, you don't need to have them on spironolactone anymore because you've got potassium supplemented fluids. If for some reason you can't take the surgery, then yes, you can attempt to use that dose to try to control things. Um, uh, I've only seen a couple of these patients, my success using um, spironolactone solely is zero, but it did work in this early case just to get Topsy's potassium a little more stable to enable the surgery to happen. Great, thank you. Um, and then there was just another one, a Cushing's question. Okay. Um, in cases where they don't seem well controlled on veteral, um, i.e. still showing clinical signs consistent with Cushing's, yep. but their pre-veteral cortisol is low, i.e. could be consistent with over-suppression if only looking at the blood results and not the clinical signs, <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Okay, so I think, um, I, I, first thing I'd say pre-pill cortisol I think is brilliant. Okay, I, I don't use it at the very beginning. I think I'd follow the DECRA advice, use your HTH stims to initially four hour post pill. But once you think you've got them stable, pre pill is great and it's easier, quicker, and cheaper. But in this situation, I would go back first to do my four hour post pill stim, okay, and see what's going on there. Um, because a lot of these patients, it's, it's to do with the half life of the court, uh, of vetral in that particular patient. Um, so um, it, it, maybe it's lasting too long. So where are we? Four hours. You might end up doing a twelve hour post pill stim as well. Okay, that's something else that you can do. Um, if you still got, you should not have suppression twelve hours. If you still got suppression twelve hours post stim, then actually the vetral is lasting longer for some reason. That patient, a very vetral when it. I, I now think vetral is brilliant. When it first came out, though, most of us hated it because there was a case, a couple of case reports of it causing adrenal necrosis. Um, I'm wondering now if it was published by, I don't know, I shouldn't say. I'm wondering, there was just this worry that it caused it caused problems, but it, I think they've used it in 100,000 patients around the world. It, it's very low instance. So um, I think you, you need to look at the half-life of the vetral. The other thing you need to look at is say, what clinical signs are making um, unstable. If it's that there's still PUPD, I think there's a unitract tract infection underneath it, or possibly there is some renal damage as a result of the hypertension. You do get hypertension with Cushing's, and have we actually got a protein urea that's persisting? So I would go back and go looking for what else. So what are that's what I say. What are the problems? What is it that you think means they're not controlled? What are the different diagnoses for those problems? So if it's PUPD, UTI, is you go back to UTI, back to UTI, back to UTI again to make sure you've ruled that out. Um, and then is there possibly a concurrent problem? So if you've got a concurrent endocrinopathy, is there a concurrent problem? So, I mean, uh, Emma, I'm happy, not mean to try to get business, but if you want to ping, if you've got a particular case you want to discuss, or you can do it either via text or, or let um, Hannah and Abby know. I'm happy to have a chat with you about it, if that would help at all. Great. Thanks, Rob. I think that's uh, I think that's just about everything. I'm going to rein us in and um, and pull it pull it to a close there. But it's been really, really fantastic. And we'll have to um, do the other cases another time or maybe we'll save them for the mentorship if anyone's interested. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I, I quite enjoyed talking about this. I'm sorry I've, I've, I've run over a little bit, but I, I hope it's been useful. I hope it's helpful. Um, and I say very if we can. Um, uh, very happy to work with you on any of the cases if you if we can. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rob. And thank you, everyone, so much for joining us tonight. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Good night. Take care.